Welcome to Action Taken, the podcast about relevant topics for both Black and Christian communities. This is a podcast for seasoned believers, those who have hidden the Word of God in their hearts, as David spoke in Psalm 119 and 11. I'm your host, Coach Laverne. That's Laverne without the E on the end. This is Lesson 28, with this episode entitled, The Protocols for Miracles, when the Lord brings you in. As always, the vision within must be allowed to penetrate without. The ultimate vision, the ultimate agenda for the church is to get the bride of Christ ready for her bridegroom, Jesus. There will be plenty of faith projects we will have to invest time in and in our generations. But until you see the heavens crack open and the trumpet sound, the vision for the body of Christ will always be to have his bride ready for a wedding and on time. I hear constantly people saying Jesus is returning, Jesus is coming, and it is true. Jesus is returning, but nothing will happen until his bride without spot or wrinkle is ready to meet him at the altar. A bridegroom will wait all day if he knows his beautiful bride is ultimately coming down that narrow aisle. So if Jesus appears to be delayed, it is because we are expecting the bride to get ready all on her own. Having said all that, this is season two, April 24th, June 26th. It is the season of the narrow way, the narrow path, the season meant to eliminate a lot of participants. In other words, cut out the fat, and in some cases, literally, if you are carrying more weight than you should, get your weight and your blood pressure down, your blood sugar down, your cholesterol down, be a person given to fasting and prayer. Don't take it for granted that you will succeed in the season simply because you love the Lord and you love and adore him. The season is for the fit among us in spirit, soul, and body. Get the sin out of your life. That's if no one hasn't already told you. So, let's talk about the fact that we're still on the eve of the promise. And now it's somewhat of a waiting game. We've done what the Lord has told us to do in terms of the previous instructions. And we're waiting for a response, next steps in terms of what to do. And... Um, You're also being probably challenged in the area of what comes after this. What will this, what will my life look like when I obtain the promise? And that's pretty much what this podcast is about today. And as such, now that you're entering in, you're going to have a new set of challenges that you didn't have before you entered in. The promise presents you with the new set of challenges. If it's that uh, using my previous example of the, uh, now that I know what it is, I think it's a Mercedes G class. <laughs> <laughs> the Mercedes Land Rover, um, now you've got to provide it with insurance. You've got to pay for the parts when they need to be repaired. You've got to have the income for all this to happen. You've got to um, be aware that others might want to steal it. Others may be jealous of you because you have it. Um, people may have certain perceptions of you because you drive it. So all these new challenges come as a result of the promise. That being the case, you're going to have to deal with the new challenges associated or will arise as a result of possessing of possessing the promise. 
And so it's kind of a, and like I said, it's all, this is a, this is always going to be an inner game. This is always an inner game. And, you know, you think, well, I need to do this on the outside and I need to do that. And it's really an inner game. It's an inner game and it will always be an inner game between you and the most high God. Because the same God that brought you in or brought you out of a situation, brought you out of bondage, okay? The same God that brought you out of bondage will be the same God that brings you into the promise. All right? And you have to be aware of that um, until you get additional instructions stating that you will approach him differently. Be prepared. be prepared to approach him the way you have before. What do I mean by that? In the case of, um, like when I'm for myself, uh, the same, the way I pray now, and I've been praying this way for over a year, is the same way I still approach him. I may do other things. For example, I started doing this podcast, but it's still the same prayers. It's just that more people are feeding on this information. It wasn't, it's not just me now, and I have to be aware of that. But be prepared to come before the Most High God the way you did. before you entered in. Now, I'm going to preface it with this. Unless he gives you additional instructions. All right? Unless he gives you additional instructions. If he says, from this day on, you will approach me thus and so. Um, or you will come to me at 5 a.m. every morning. Or you will do this particular practice before you do, you know. Whatever it is, then you do it that way. But until you get further instructions, you keep doing it. You keep coming to him the way you've always come to him. If he says... I want you to change and approach me this way, then you change. If he says, change your approach before me, then change your approach. But, that's only if he says so. Don't you change on your own because you're tired of doing it. Okay? Because you don't want to keep doing it. All right. So, um, understand, now this was something that I had to deal with when I'm considering the promise. I'm like, why does it have to be so big? Why does it have to be so extravagant? 
But it, here is where the Most High God has to walk you through blessing you in a way that's bigger than you are. And it, it, what comes to mind, and, and, and I'm not trying to piggyback off of anybody, but I remember um, a, a sermon that uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes preached uh, when he, not early in his career because he's been preaching for quite some time, but it was early when he became a phenomenon, okay, on, on uh, religious television. And there was this teaching about, can you stand to be blessed? Can you stand to be blessed? And, you know, when you're not being blessed, <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny, but when you're not being blessed, you don't understand what that means. When you are blessed, you have additional challenges. You have things that come into your life that you did not foresee. So, and it looks like I'm talking about the same thing here, and I'm not. I, I'm taking it a little further because you're thinking that if I had chosen for myself, I would have chosen something that was less extravagant, not so big, um, and not so showy. Okay, but this is not about you and your desires. It's about him and his desires for you. Okay, it's about him and his desires for you. And that can be a little disconcerting when you want to be a person given to um, um, smallness. I'm just going to call it what it is, smallness. You want to be a person given to smallness. Because see, when, you, you, when you're a person given to smallness, you don't have to try so hard. It's like you're, you're, you're not afraid of failure. You're afraid of success. You have this fear of success. And I remember someone um, saying this to us. I'm like, no, I have a fear of failure. And he's like, no, you have a fear of success. And they're like, I don't, we didn't even, <laughs> we were in this, um, this is when I was on Skid Row and we had worked on this, um, this is around the time I was working on that newsletter called uh, The Shift. Oh my God, I didn't even think about this. It was called The Shift. It literally was called The Shift, but then we had to rename it Agile Shift because somebody else had the same name and they, theirs was called The Shift. So I had to rename it Adro Ship because the, the name of the organization was called Adro. It was Access, Dignity, Respect, and Opportunity. That's what the, the letters stand for, Adro. And so we we're doing this thing in uh, uh, Skid Row, Los Angeles. <laughs> it was a hot mess. It was such a hot mess. And it was at the time I was a hot mess. I, I really did not make a good participant in this organization. Oh, my God. Oh my God, I did not make make such a good um, example. Oh my God, so, such a mess, such a mess. Oh, bad memories, just think about it. But anyway, the guy that was running, he was actually a millionaire. He, he had worked with um, a, like five or six presidents of the United, U.S. presidents. He worked with, he and his, or his, he and his partner had worked with five different organizations. They were Jewish, and the guy was Jewish. And his, he was, he worked with, let's see, he didn't work with Bush. He worked with Clinton. He worked with Daddy Bush. He worked with Reagan. He worked with um, uh, Jimmy Carter. And I think he worked with Gerald Ford. So about five or six of them. But I remember specifically because it was back in 2003, 2004, and he said he had not worked with uh, George W. Bush, which is the son, not Daddy Bush. But he did work with Daddy Bush. Um, and um, we, we had this, oh, it's such a mess when I think about it now. When I think about where I am now in the Lord and where I was then and 
Ugh, the lack of discipline that I have. And all the gossiping and the backbiting that was going on. <sighs> this thing about makes you crazy. But one of the things he was trying to get through to us was that we were dealing, we're not just with the fear, fear of failure, we were dealing with the fear of success. And at the time, <laughs> we, were so, we were so clueless. I remember this one guy, I, can't, I won't say his name, but we were like, um, no, it's a fear of failure. We feel a feel your fear of failure. He's like, no, you have a fear of success. Because he was thinking, no, we didn't want to, we were afraid to stretch ourselves. And that wasn't even on our radar. We didn't even understand what that meant. Okay. So the whole point I'm saying with this is that a lot of times our ideal is so low for ourselves. Our ideal for ourselves is so low something big is inconceivable and we wouldn't choose it Therefore, we wouldn't choose it. So we need a, a, a holy God to do the choosing for us. We need a holy God to do the choosing for us. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And, and, and that's true. His ways are higher. than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And, and that's where you have to know your role in the project and the faith project. Remember, and it was so prof this was so profound. And I know this was the the the, the, Lord, the most high God speaking through me was that His concern will always be about the how and the why, and yours will be about the what the where, and the when. All right. And, and, the, and that's tough to wrap your head around. Um, I don't know, I'm just sitting here thinking about it, just pondering, it just hit me, and I don't know, it just hit me in a kind of a <sighs> glorious way. It just hit me in such a glorious way. It's just, I'm, I'm almost, almost speechless, almost, almost left speechless, almost left speechless. <sighs> I'm just left speechless.
Because there's ways. Lessons and ways we, oh my God, we, we just, we don't know. We don't know. And you have to um, come to terms with his, what he wants for you is so much more than you would ever think for yourself. So much more. It's, it's outside of the realm of conception, of your own conception. But in the meantime, when you come into this, because this is something that's naturally going to come on you. It's naturally going to come on you, particularly if you're coming from a very low place financially, coming from a different status, from a lower, a very low status to a higher status. You're going to have to deal with the feeling that you're a freeloader possessing the promise. You're going to feel like a freeloader possessing the promise. Wow. I, I almost, I almost can't. Oh, wow. Oh, God. People are going to look at you like um, you got over or that you, somehow you got over on someone or worse, if you're a woman, you slept with or had sex with someone. To get what you have. And it was nothing like that. And, and, and I remember uh, before I was coming up with these points and the, the Most High God was just walking me through all this. Literally was walking me through this because I was just like, well, I feel like people are going to look at me a certain kind of way for possessing this. And I felt that the person, the, 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 this thing that was going to come into my possession, um, I would look like someone who is feeling, uh, what's the word? What do you call it? Entitled. Entitled. Having this incredible sense of entitlement. And... There's the times when you, when, when you're being accused of that, you can feel like you want to draw back. You know, it make you feel like you want to draw back because you, you don't want that uh, label assigned to you. Okay. Um, but it isn't, it is not, a sense of entitlement and the reason why you should refrain from withdraw withdrawing or, or drawing yourself back is because this is kingdom um, promises. Because in the kingdom, things are attracted to you. And they will seek you out or you will be drawn to it. And I'm going to give you some scriptures. I typically wouldn't do this because it, I know the scriptures, but I want to give them to you. There is the promise of 
of the the promise of the curse. I'm going to start with the promise of the curse. And it starts in Genesis, not the one that happens in Deuteronomy. It says, this is after the fall of man and woman. <laughs> um, in the sweat of thy face shall thy shall thou eat bread this is king james till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and thus thou shall return and you when you get so used to the curse the lifestyle associated with the curse Lifestyle associated with the curse. The promise of the sweat of your brow being how you eat and how you receive things. You and you and you know. If you grew up that way, or if you didn't work for it, then you, it wasn't gained honestly. And what you have to understand is that um, in the kingdom, it's not like that. That's one scripture. I'm going to give you scripture about um, blessings overtaking you. do this first. I'm trying to do two things at one time. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, the, the presence of God is really strong in this room and I'm trying to stay up instead of giving into it and flowing into it. But that scripture was Genesis 3, 19. Okay. That's Genesis 3, 19. The sweat of your brow. Instead of the blessing being attracted to you, um, you've got to sweat for it. You've got to use your physical, external nature to get it instead of it being attracted to your inward nature. Now, let's go to um, Deuteronomy 28, where... Um, 28 and 2, this is King James. And all these things, all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. This is getting instructions. Getting instructions. Um, wow, well, okay. He's giving me another one. All right. I wasn't even thinking about that one. But let's do that one too. And I did this one used to get me. Yeah. <sighs> Deuteronomy eight and eighteen. Get the power to get wealth, which is like I was like. <laughs> this is so stupid. This is how I knew I was a, a silly Christian. As or one of my friends used to say, I was an airhead. <laughs> I mean, no, she said she said I was a space cadet. That's what she said. Um, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear to thy fathers as it is this day. And this is Deuteronomy 18, the power to get wealth. And I used to think that, you know, um, that the, it's not... 
it's not the thing that he gives you. He gives you the power to get it. The power to get it. Okay. Let me see something. I don't know, I typically don't do this, but I'm going to do it in this case. I'm going to look up the actual scripture in, in the Hebrew. I don't typically do this. Um, Oh, that word power. It's strength, power, might, force, ability, being able, able, chameleon that you're changing into, the fruits, powerful, substance, wealth, weary. Um, In the out and then in the outline, this is from um, blueletterbible.org, blueletterbible.org, and it talks about um, the one Bible um, Bible definition usage is its strength, power, might. And see, when I was learning this stuff, it wasn't really apparent to me. It's human strength. And this is how this word is used. The strength of angels, which can be value valuable too. Um, the strength, the power of God. The strength of animals. Wow. The strength. Produce. Wealth. Of soil. All right. I don't think it's talking about this. It's koak, koak. It's from an unused root, meaning to be firm, vigor, literally force in a good or bad sense. Figuratively, capacity means to produce. All right. So you're given power to do something. And in that power on the earth, this is how you appropriate kingdom promises and then appropriate them in the earth. All right. This is the power that he provides you to, to gather up, to gain wealth. He'll give you the wisdom to get it. And then he'll give you the power to execute on that wisdom. All right, and that's all I'm going to, I could go into more scriptures because I could do seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you, you know, that kind of thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. The righteousness part is very important as well. Um, yeah. So don't feel like a freeloader possessing the promise because you're not a freeloader. This is the power of God coming upon you and allowing you to possess something that he desires for you to have. And you can sit many days as you like to worship him and adore him and give him thanks for the thing that he has entered you into. All right. Um, um, now let's talk about the desire to draw back because it's going to come on you. 
the desire to draw back. And it's not from God. That desire is not from God. Because it would be silly to desire you to have something, then turn around and say he doesn't want you to have it. That's the that's the 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 the, the um, religious nature, or a uh, the powers of darkness, or the. the negative forces telling you to feel guilty about succeeding when others are failing. Particularly when your enemies are going to be watching you walk into this daily. And you may get the desire to draw back for any number of reasons. When you look into the face of God and he tells you things, or you listen to, your ear is so closely, close to his mouth, and he's whispering in your ear and telling you, as I used to say, I said in another conversation about that intimacy, when he's giving, when, when pillow talk is going on, okay? When pillow talk is going on, you're getting um, um, information that others aren't um, given. And so you have to recognize what that means. Others are going to sit back and say, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve this. Others will say, you don't deserve this. And a lot of people are going to get accuse you of Sleeping your way to the top. Um, then you're going to be like, how are you going to pay for this? The concerns about how to, you know, how to pay for it. how to maintain it. How to keep it. Uh, as in avoid theft or damage. In other words, all the headaches and the cares of this world. Or as I used to make this joke, like when you get you get an upgrade. <laughs> This, you know, it's, it's funny when you talk about it and you don't have anything, but when you start to get stuff, it's a real thing. When you don't have anything, it's a joke. When it becomes a real thing, it's not a joke anymore. And I used to make this joke about rich people problems. <laughs> you know, rich people problems. Like, um, I remember there was this guy, um, he was a well-known actor in the I think it was the 70s, in the 80s, I believe it was. It was an 80s television show. It was called Dallas. And the, one of the main characters was um, uh, performed by an actor named Larry Hagman. And Larry Hagman, <laughs> when I think about this, when I think about it, it's so funny. 
Uh, Larry Hagman, um, if you don't know, was also in a show called I Dream of Dini. And he was, that show had been in syndication for a long time. And if you don't know what syndication means, that every time that particular episode runs, they get some sort of royalties or whatever for every time it, it, it airs on television anywhere in the earth. All right. And so, um, but somehow, um, and he, I guess he, he vowed to not go back into show business again. But um, he said, he alleges in this one particular um, interview, and I don't know how true it is, but I just, I it never, I never forgot it as long as I lived because I thought it was the most funniest thing on earth. He said that he got down to his last $100,000 dollars and he realized he needed to go back to work and so that's why he took the role as um uh, jr ewing because jr ewing was not a nice guy and in comparison to um see is it major nelson i think he was major nelson I dream of Jeannie because there was Major Healy and then there was Major Nelson. And I think Major Nelson was performed by um, um, by Larry Hagman. Yeah, Major Healy was the other guy. Yeah, was his best friend. <laughs> I don't know why this brings is such a joy. It just tickled me. It, it was just that he, he said, well, you know, um, I, I took the role. Because uh, Major Nelson was a very nice, lovable, affable character that um, it was he was a goody two-shoes type of guy. But a genie, which was the genie that came to live with him, um, she would sometimes get him in a little trouble. But he was a, it was basically a good guy, all right. And so, but this J.R. Ewing guy, um, he was not a good guy, and he felt this you know this would change the way people looked at him. But it was good money, so he took the role, and. Um, it, it became a legendary role. It's more popular than the I Dream of Jeannie role. People forget that he was Major Nelson from I Dream of Jeannie because he was such a nasty guy in Dallas, in the, in the television show called Dallas. And, um, but yeah, but that show kept him afloat because he got down to his last $100,000. And I thought it was 100 thing. I'm thinking, if, man, if you put $100,000 in my bank account, I would be such and such, such and such, you know. And a lot of people feel that way. It's like 100000 When you don't have $100,000, that's a big deal. But when you're used to millions and you get down to your last $100,000, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. All right? So... It's my, my whole point is wealth is relative, right? When you're, when you're on the come up, $100,000 is un, unimaginable. When you're on the come up, five million seems like a lot of money. But when you're on the come down and you're used to trillions or billions, like a Jeff Bezos, you know, and you get down to your last $100,000, you are in trouble when you're, used to tri to trillions and you're down to your last hundred thousand dollars you are in trouble so it's all wealth is relative to where you were previously okay wealth is relative to where you were previously and I'm curious I, I, I feel like I need to say this and I don't understand why but I'm going to say this I have a feeling that after we enter into the promise the way we speak about spiritual things is going to change a lot
what we talk about. I mean, I'm inter I'm interested to see, interested to see what what I will be talking about on this podcast when we all enter into the promise. I I don't. I can't even imagine because a lot of what I'm talking about now is about entering in. And I'm wondering, will I have the same, will I become overconfident thinking that I can pivot from the Lord? Yeah. Will I become overconfident in my own abilities? That I don't even inquire of the Lord. Anymore. I pray that I don't. I pray that I don't do that. <clears throat> you have uh, been given access a specific amount of intimate connection <laughs> with the most high god that pillow talk that info that not's not given to everybody and others will say you don't deserve this others will say you don't deserve this so If that is the case, um, you're just going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to um, settle it within your heart that you either go on with the Most High God or you fall back into the hands of people who really don't have your best interests at heart. They're there to talk say what they're going to say, but they will never desire to achieve anything great. They just are there to just backbite and talk. Um, the concerns that you have to pay for the promise, to maintain the promise, to keep the promise are part of the intimate relation that you and the Most High will gain as you both go together on a new level. He's going on a new level with you in the earth and you're going on a new level on the earth as well. Okay. Don't become overconfident in your ability because it's not really about your ability. It's about his ability to get things done in the earth through you and to you and to those who are connected to you. Don't get overconfident. I pray you don't. I pray I don't get so overconfident that I stop inquiring of God about my next steps in whatever it may be. All right. Remain compassionate as best you can. Some people do deserve help from you. Um, and that's maybe that's an area where the most High God will have to deal with me on. Um, some people, like not there, some people are the poor who do deserve your help, but it doesn't really benefit you them very much to get the money in their hand, um, directly in their hand because they're going to waste it. But you can give to various organizations that will assist them in helping them get on the right track. Moreover, the promise will help you to leverage to your next level. This miracle is not the last miracle. It is a miracle that you will use to go, you and the Most High will go to another level with. 
So don't think this is the last one of miracles in the history of miracles. We're just getting started with this thing. Okay. This is not about you. If you're not in agreement with receiving the promise. It's important. And I'm going to, when I, when I was given this particular note, this point, it wasn't really spelled out clearly, but after discussing it <clears throat> in this podcast, it became clear to me. This is what you need to do to remain in alignment with the Most High God in this faith project. You're going to agree with the promise and agree to receive the promise that will keep you in perfect collaboration in this faith project. If you agree with the promise, but you don't agree to receiving the promise, you're not in perfect collaboration with the Most High God, and you're not in perfect collaboration with this faith project. It's not enough just to agree. you got to agree and agree to receive. Both have to be present, all right? Now, just flat out, drawing back, as in, I don't want to receive this, this is too much, it comes with too high a price, is bad. You don't want to be one of those who don't want to receive the promise. You don't want to be a Hebrews 10, 38 to 39 person. Okay, you don't want, to, you don't want your soul to, um, the Most High God's soul to not have pleasure in you. Okay, you don't want it because you don't know when you'll need your next yes. And you giving him a no right now could cost you that. And people say, oh, no, he's a God of love. Certain projects he's very serious about. And if you don't know that, you better go and ask somebody. See, when it's that little bitty pity pat, you know, uh, pity pat type stuff, it does. It may not matter very much. But on the high stake stuff, oh, yes, it matters a lot. And you cannot be drawn back. And there's a higher price to pay. When the greater reward, a greater the risk, greater the price to pay if it doesn't work. Or if you fail to do your part of the agreement, of the project. You're not going into this alone. He is with you. You don't have to worry about being ashamed. And recognize that you not entering in or agreeing to receive your portion of a promise could cause other people who are connected to you to, to miss it. You become essentially poison in your community. Mm, now we get to the crux of the matter. <laughs> Now we're getting to the crux of the matter. Could it be that there is a whole lot of black preachers? I'm going to pick with you today. You know I'm coming for you. African-American preachers who secretly draw back to the detriment of their own communities. Hmm. Okay. And nobody would ever know because, you know, it's only a, a secret soul thing. <laughs> nobody knows but you and God. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, just a thought, just a food for thought. Let's do our corporate promise. All right. I is the Most High God speaking to you, and you are the person who's listening to this promise being read. I will help you to deal with all the new challenges that will arise from possessing the promise. I will help you to deal with the fact that it's not about you and your desires. It is about my desires for you. I will help you to deal with feeling like a freeloader when you possess your promise. I will help you deal with the fact that you you're in this now. 
and you cannot draw back because you don't want the headaches or cares associated with possessing the promise. I will help you to deal with the knowing it's not about you if you stay in agreement with the promise. I will help you deal with the fact that it will be about you if you don't remain in agreement with the promise. I will help you deal with how I feel about people who draw back from a promise. I will help you deal with knowing you would cause others to miss it because you did decide it to draw back. This word shall not return to me empty. That's all I have for you today, folks. I'm your host, Coach Laverne, and that's Laverne without the E on the end for action taken. And if you didn't know, this podcast can also be viewed on YouTube in its entirety. So if you watched it on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, and select the bell notification for when new action taken podcasts drop. Our next broadcast is June 1st. Have a wonderful and prosperous day. See you soon.